I'm Dr. Angela Yankee, and I'm at Age Management Medicine Group uh, in Tucson, Arizona, with a women's health expert, <laughs> Dr. Angela DeRosa. Mm, so wonderful to be here. You gave a fantastic lecture oh, thank you. covering many aspects of women's mm-hmm. health. First, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your training mm-hmm. and what brought you to this space? Well, it was really kind of a professional and personal collision because I was one of those 10% of women that were diagnosed with premature ovarian failure oh. at the age of 35. Oh. Um, so it, it, I found myself during my medical school and residency training smack dab in the middle of all the perimenopausal symptoms and then went through full-blown menopause at 35. So oh. the way I was so badly treated by the medical profession and just struggled, I mean, by the time I was 30, I was on five medications to treat all the underlying symptoms of hormonal imbalance when all I needed was hormones. So oh my goodness. at that point, I realized that instead of becoming part of the problem of traditional medicine and becoming that patronistic, there, there, sweetheart, you're stressed, or all those nonsensical things we tell women, that I really wanted to dedicate my career to understanding the role of hormones and how it not only played from a quality of life, but as an internist, also how does it manage chronic illness? So I've been on a mission ever since and now at the age of 52 I've still got a ways to go but it's been a great journey thus far. So let me guess what you were on. (laughs) I bet they put you on something for sleep. Oh yes. Something for depression. Yes ma'am. Potentially they pat you on the back with the weight gain Mm -hmm. that you had. I was on metformin, beta blockers (laughs) for the heart palpitations and tachycardias I was having. It was horrible and it's I'm just so glad to be off of all of that. So it sounds to me like like Dr. DeRosa, you took a bad situation and flipped it to a good situation because it became yeah. your passion to help other people? Well, I think a lot of things that happen to us, we, we turn our own miseries into passions. And I honestly believe that um, that was one of the reasons God or whatever spirit you believe in put me on this journey was that I was supposed to have that happen so that now I can become an ambassador for women. And through my own practices now, through my training, uh, Hormonal Health Institute training other clinicians on how to do this, the more we get the knowledge out, the, the correct knowledge about hormonal health, the better we can do and the more we can treat our patients appropriately. So this is personal for me. Yeah. <laughs> so. I always say that God makes lemonade out of lemons. Yes, exactly. So I, I agree from my own experience, actually. Yeah. Can we talk about your journey with bioidentical Mm -hmm. hormone replacement therapy. So it was really fantastic. I had the opportunity early in my career to work for Procter & Gamble as their senior medical director, and I was in charge of their women's health line, which we had launched in several countries, not here in the U.S., unfortunately, um, on Intrinza testosterone patch for women. And when I was doing that kind of learning and education, um, I had the opportunity to study with the world's leading experts in sexual health, um, hormonal health, and through the picking up of knowledge as you go, I tried all kinds of therapies on myself. So I was my own personal guinea pig. Sure. <laughs> so I've been on creams, gels, trochies, patches, crazy compounds. I've done more damage to myself in the name of research. Um, and But through that process and also learning scientifically, I managed to figure out the role of bioidentical hormones and how instrumental, and in particular in proper balance, um, as you and I know, know that sometimes we don't use enough testosterone in women and too much estrogen, and figuring out the best modalities and so now I although I, I prescribe patches I prescribe creams gels ODTs I really have come to believe and um, the savior for me was always pellets in the bioidentical format and they saved my life and I just I, I'm a strong staunch believer in pellets so, so that's about delivery but let's backpedal even yeah. just to the concept of yeah. hormone replacement yes. therapy because in the conventional world it's not even generally accepted no. at this point so let's go ahead and reward wind back to the Women's Health Initiative and the oh. studies in 2001, 2002. Yeah. Let's go through some of that data that you well, were Well, it's just today. crazy to me when that came out. I mean, it was the shot heard around the world, and all of a sudden, everybody was fearful of hormones because of this one in four, quote-unquote, chance of developing breast cancer, which we both know is really eight out of 10,000. And when you actually looked at that data, which was put out initially, it was false. It was statistically incorrect, and they had to make some corrections. And ultimately, even the worst preparation, PremPro, which we don't even use largely in clinical practice anymore, showed a neutral risk for breast cancer when you actually delved in. And unfortunately, so much damage was done from that shot that we are now 20 plus, almost 20 years later, and we're still recovering from that. That day when they stopped that trial reminds me of the day the Space Shuttle Columbia blew up Mm. because my 
phone was ringing <laughs> off the hook, I could get oh, nothing yeah. done that no, day. No, I mean, women were coming off their hormones left to right. And it's still the sad part for me is that I can understand the lay population still having some of that fear. But our own colleagues yes. who should know better and should be able to read research and understand, there's lots of data out there that largely refuted some of the points that came out. And I honestly, as I stated in my talks, that one single study has irreparably harmed women's health for decades to come. We will still have more to come to recover. Well, that's why I think you and I are both in this game of educating yes. both uh, physicians, fellow mm -hmm. physician colleagues, as well mm -hmm. as the general public. Yeah, we have to. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so bioidentical hormone replacement therapy mm -hmm. generally has really good studies now, especially oh, yeah. like the French study with Agnes Fournier mm -hmm. versus the English study. Mm -hmm. So the French use bioidentical progesterone, mm -hmm. whereas the English don't, and mm -hmm. they have the English have increased risk of breast cancer, yeah. but they're not in France, right? No, but that's the problem is some of the best research and data is outside of the U.S., but we're so arrogant in believing that only good data can come from the U.S. when actually the lion's share of it, and I saw it firsthand working at Procter & Gamble, comes from sponsored trials by Big Pharma here in the U.S. where largely outside of the U.S. they tend to be more university-based and less conflicted in a lot of ways. So it's really unfortunate that we are so staunch about having our own data, which, yes. is, which is definitely compromised. So in your practice, mm -hmm. do you have, do you have to mm -hmm. treat a lot of women and yeah. men? We treat women and men, um, obviously <laughs> more women than men because my background is in women's health, but as I started to evolve as an internist, with the women felt better, they dragged their husbands on in. So um, we treat probably 20% of males in our practice and 80% females, but I, I call them the comedic relief because women, you know, we cry yes, and yes. we're so emotional and the guys come in and they're a lot of fun to work with. It's much easier to treat men. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and like so when it comes to compliance issues, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> so um, in your practice, do they generally get bioidentical hormone replacement Absolutely. therapy? I will not prescribe hormones that are not bioidentical mm -hmm. hormones. They have to meet that criteria as a first and foremost. So do they have to be symptomatic to get hormones in general, mm -hmm. or do you just think it's an anti-aging wellness Think, let me put you on hormones if you need it. Well, I think we have to be cautious is that we shouldn't be blanketly putting hormones out there. Although, as a fellow internist, you understand that there are a role, say, of testosterone and insulin resistance and preventative from cardiovascular. So the argument could be said, well, let's just put everybody on it right out of the gate. But I think there's a point in time where it becomes more instrumental to start, and that's usually when they start developing the symptomology. And also, you'll get more support from our colleagues if we can at least demonstrate that not only do they may have um, low testosterone levels, but most often they don't meet the guidelines, as we say, but that they at least have a symptom and syndrome that we can assign to that makes sense clinically, and then it deals with the, the ultimate chronic disease states. Yeah, maybe it would be a good time for you to review like the early perimenopausal mm -hmm. transition, what you're thinking, the middle, and then the more advanced with estrogen yeah. decline. So I, I try to simplify it into stage one, two, and three. And stage one is really that testosterone deficiency, which always happens first. So as the ovaries decline, the production of testosterone, which is 95% of it, declines rapidly because we don't store it anywhere like we do in our fat of estrogen. So I like to see, so you're going to typically see testosterone deficiency first, then once we, and that's usually in the mid-30s, and then it's going to be followed by the estrogen deficiencies, which I categorize mild, moderate, severe, mild, they're getting hot flashes, night sweats, and those symptoms, right, the day before their period or the day of, kind of when the estrogen's at their lowest, then the moderates when they're having all those symptomology throughout the month and becoming more severe, and then severe is really when they become anovulatory. And then once Mother Nature says, okay, the ovaries retired, then we move into stage three menopause. So based on that kind of staging, I can properly figure out how I want to treat them. So full testosterone replacement all the way through. But in those early stage two of the mild, moderate, severe, I'm starting with very, very low support doses of estradiol and amping up a little, and then full replacement in menopause. Wow, that's great framework to think yeah. about it. Simplify. Yeah. <laughs> Could you share with us it, what delivery system you're using at those three stages of estrogen decline? So typically, I love pellets all the way through, but if I'm going to use support dose estrogen, it's usually, for those of you who understand pellets, the 6, 10 milligram doses, which is the okay. very lowest, and then you get into replacement. It could be 10, 12.5, 15, as we move closer to the menopause and into menopause. But if you're, say, using a bias formulation, the support dose may be a 0 0.25 milligram or 0 0.5 milligram, but once you get to full replacement, we're 5 a milligram 
and above, depending on various factors. Got so, it. And where does the testosterone fit? Do you start using testosterone pellets in the 30s? Oh, uh, if the patient, you, most patients start to exhibit testosterone deficiency mid to late 30s mm -hmm. on average. So pellets all the way through. I mean, or or you can use testosterone creams or ODTs. But generally, once they're starting hormone therapy, testosterone becomes the foundation because they're always deficient in it always. Um, but then estrogen can get added on depending on their deficiencies and also risk factors. Mm. How do you deal with the, the potential for pregnancy ah, in yes. the early perimenopause and you're pelleting the women? Yeah, you have to be cautious. So we always, when we're putting testosterone pellets or any preparation, we have to have them sign consents that they're not going to get pregnant or tell us what form of birth control you're using. Have you had an IUD? Are you on birth control pills? Which we, I'm not a fan of birth control pills overall. But we have to be careful of that category X classification. Yeah. So but you'll put you'll pellet it with testosterone someone who's on oral contraceptive yes. medications. Yes, a lot of times that's a cause of it. So we have to be careful that yeah. the OCPs aren't the driving factor. Sure. If we can remove that and they regain their normal testosterone function, that's great. Then we don't need it. We fix the underlying cause. But oftentimes, if say they're already in their 40s, we remove the birth control. They may already be testosterone deficient. So we could leave the birth control and just add the Got testosterone. It. So it depends on the clinical scenario. Wow, you definitely are a women's <laughs> health expert. And I wanted to thank you for joining us oh, in this it's my interview. my pleasure. Thank you for having me. If I had to summarize what you taught today, mm -hmm. it would be number one, bioidentical hormone replacement mm -hmm. therapy should mm -hmm. be considered in women and men who mm -hmm. are symptomatic. Absolutely. Uh, number two, make sure it's bioidentical. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and number three, I like the simplification of uh, estrogen and, uh, deficiency into three stages. Yeah. I think that's a very useful way to look at um, how to treat it, mild, moderate, and mm -hmm. severe, and how to intervene with dosing. And then finally, the foundation mm -hmm. of testosterone loss yeah. uh, in the mid-30s. It's funny because I've always thought progesterone dropped first, mm -hmm. then, I'll, then testosterone, then estrogen. Yeah. So I'll have to relook at that. <laughs> so thank, thank you so much for You're joining welcome. us, Dr. DeRozan. Excellent job on your presentation thank today. Thank you so much. I so appreciate it. Mm -hmm.